Hello, and welcome to the Six Figure Developer Podcast, the podcast where we talk about new and exciting technologies, professional development, clean code, career advancement, and more. I am John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash. With us today is Bryce Lamson. Bryce is a senior software engineer on the Entity Framework team at Microsoft. In his spare time, he enjoys giving back to the community through blogging and open source. Welcome, Bryce. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah, so uh, before we kind of dig into Entity Framework, uh, would you maybe just give our listeners a little bit of a history about yourself? Uh, tell them maybe how you got started in the industry. Sure. Um, I can. I remember wanting to be a program programmer since I was like age twelve. We always had a computer in the house. My dad was a worked for was a manager of a CAD department, uh, a drafting in, uh, mm -hmm. firm, and so I always got his hand me down computers. And a friend of mine one day showed me this cool program called QBasic, where you can make your computer beep. Um, <laughs> so that was really my intro. And from there, you know, I branched out to HTML and JavaScript. Uh, my parents were really supportive. They bought me Sam's Teach Yourself C++ in 24 hours. I still don't think I've learned C++ <laughs> it's been much longer than 24 hours. Um, but yeah, I, I remember in high school, my dad said, hey, we have this access database we like to use for um, just keeping track of the projects we do at the firm. Um, and so I put a PHP front end on top of an access file. Um, and, and after that, I learned about MySQL and, and ASP.NET and, you know, I just took off from there. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Uh, in high school, I remember right next to my high school, we had a com uh, community college. And so I, I signed up one summer to take uh, VB6 um, and I got the, the main reason I did that was to get the student discount so I could buy a visual C++. <laughs> um, and that was around the time .NET was coming out and that was my intro to .NET. So I actually started on Visual Basic, believe it or not, um, despite loving C Sharp nowadays. Um, and then, yeah, I, I went to college, um, a huge focus on data and data modeling. And my first job was actually at Novell, uh, throwback to the 90s for NetWare. Um, they, they also sponsored the Open Open SUSE, Open SUSE. I still never learned how to say it. Um, <laughs> Linux distro, and they took on the Mono project. Um, but I was actually doing Java development, and I was trying to convince them, "Hey, let's use Mono," um, for about three years before I finally switched over to Microsoft. That's nice. that's that's my start. <laughs> okay, uh, so the these days you are with Microsoft, and you're uh, on the Entity Framework team. What what's that like? Yeah, I've been here um, for ten years, and I absolutely love it. Um, I, you know, I've been I've been thinking about what to say, uh, what what story I could tell that would add value. I mean, you've had Julie Lerman, you've had John Smith. What more could I possibly add to that? Um, they're they've written books on this stuff. You know, they know it in and out, and I've just seen kind of my story in it. But I've been really inspired by Richard Richard Campbell's work on mm -hmm. you know the history of .NET, and I feel like there's a story there for EF. You know, the history of EF. Um, that I'd, I'd love to tell if you guys are interested. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, you know, half of this is legend sort of before I came on, and it's all just myth, the mythos of, of the team, the culture. But apparently, um, Entity Framework actually started way back in the days of Windows Longhorn. Um, and it was a key component of Windows FS, WinFS, this file system that was based on SQL Server, this crazy pipe dream where your files could expose like these entity contracts and any app could understand any file. That was really weird. <laughs> um, and so along with that was this, this Microsoft research project um, to sort of go from this entity data model, uh, this EDM, which is where we got the EDM file, um, which was a, a conceptual view of your data and then it mapped to sort of a storage layer. Um, and so it translated this this conceptual entity view into this storage SQL. And this thing is like rocket science. I mean, nobody on the team understands what it does. Uh, <laughs> we had a we had a PhD intern and he spent like three months looking at this thing. He added about three calls to two list and made it about 30 times faster. <laughs> uh, so be sure to call two list. It's one, one uh, <laughs> story to learn there. Um, don't reiterate your innumerables, um, but but yeah, it's just this crazy complex um, piece of logic. And then they built Energy Framework on top of it. Um, and in 
2006, I guess, is when this stuff went public. Julie Lehrman was there. I think she knew about it before it went public. This was long before my time. <laughs> um, I was just starting college around that time. Um, and, and so we had like these early days and we insisted like, this is not an ORN, you know, this is a library. We're working with this thing called EDM, you know, and putting a, storing, storing these entities inside of a SQL database. Um, and, and then on the other hand, we had this thing that eventually became OData. I think it was called like data services at the time. And it was putting a, a REST service on top of these entities, th these APIs to expose these entities. And so we, we actually were in, we were on the same team for a long time, the OData team and the Entity Framework team. Um, we've since diverged quite a bit. <laughs> um, let's see, and, and yeah, like, Oh, at the same time, you know, we had we had like this this entity SQL dialect. I don't know if you've ever used Hibernate in the Java world, but they have their mm -hmm. own dialect in SQL that then translates to SQL, and that was cool. But at the same time, this really radical new technology called Link was coming along. So, it, you know, despite everyone insisting that Entity Framework was not an ORM, it was looking more and more like an ORM every day. <laughs> Eventually, they conceded, like. Yeah, okay. I guess I guess this would make a pretty good ORM technology. Problem was at the same time we had Link to SQL. Mm -hmm. um, and so Link to SQL was being developed by uh, in the dev div organization, the developer division, the teams in charge of .NET and Visual Studio. And Entity Framework was being developed by the SQL team. Um, and they were kind of like in competition with each other, you know, you know, the diagram with the Microsoft org chart with the guns pointing at each other, you know, <laughs> the SQL org pointing the gun at the developer division. Like, um, yeah, everyone's trying to gain ground. Uh, and so, you know, we kind of have a problem and this, this went back and forth and I think it escalated, I hear a tale that it escalated all the way to like Balmer and Scott Gu in this meeting. We're like, which one's gonna survive and, you know, like duke it out, whichever one survives will will go on um, and obviously energy framework one and then they kind of slowly killed off um, link to sql um, in the af teams to the detriment of data access uh, we actually love uh, nowadays a lot of the things we do in ef core we look at what did link to sql do <laughs> and it's a huge source of inspiration um, even the stack overflow guys um, they recently ported from link to sql to ef core and it was a really a delightful experience they said Hmm. Um, yeah, I, I remember uh, hearing about the tales of of different teams working on on Link to SQL and and Link to Entities and and uh, the division between the two and and just the the opposition of, of of differing thoughts of kind of addressing it from different angles. Um, but I, I've had experience with I did LLBL Gen years and years ago. I, I um, around the time that I was uh, introduced to Entity Framework was, I think, EF uh, Entity Framework version four, uh, where it started to become usable uh, by by novices and 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 people not actually on the team, um, and uh, and working with uh, like in Hibernate uh, and, and things like that. So um, it seems like in, Entity Framework version four and then version six. Uh, were the the most widely adopted? Is that accurate, oh, or, yeah. or is that just we're, the team is blown away by the success of Energy Framework? Because yeah, we were like going head to head with Hibernate for a long time. Like Hibernate had this that came from the the Hibernate and Java world, which was just like really mature, really powerful object relational mapper, and it feels like Energy Framework was always kind of playing catch up, um, just because mm -hmm. Hibernate had that huge legacy of, of functionality. Um, but yeah, I mean, you look at the recent uh, NuGet trends and it, we're just blown away by the success of Entity Framework. Um, part of that might just be the Microsoft brand, you know, being in the box mm -hmm. has a huge advantage. Um, so yeah, I think it was Hanselman calling Entity Framework 4.1 the Magic Unicorn Edition. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, yeah, kind of before we jump there, I actually want to go back because there was this, this horrible snafu, if I can use that word. <laughs> um, like, so the Energy Framework team way back, like right after version one, uh, everyone's like, well, this is great, but like, I want to use POCOs, mm -hmm. you know, like mm -hmm. I don't want to inherit from Energy Object. And so we put out this, this design blog post and it's like, all you have to do is implement this interface called iPOCO. 
And it's like, <laughs> and it's basically like, instead of inheriting from our class, you can just implement our base class and, and the community. Just like, what the heck are you guys doing? Yeah, it was terrible. And so and it, like, out of that came um, this vote of no confidence. You know, a bunch of the Microsoft MVPs got together they're like, Microsoft has no idea what they're doing. They don't know how to make an ORM. They killed like the SQL. And it was signed by a bunch of these MVPs. And I think that was a, a that's a huge turning point for the entity framework team. That's when we fully committed to becoming you know, an ORM, you know, like let's make a, a usable interface. Um, and then yeah, out of that came this uh, DB context and code first. We called it code only at the time, which I still think is a better name because just because it's code first doesn't mean you don't have an existing database of <laughs> marketing, you know, they come in and change things. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, and so we really started to get this, this beautiful DB context with these awesome defaults and this philosophy of convention over configuration. If my property is called ID, why do I have to configure it to be the ID? Um, and yeah, that's when, that's when we realized, uh, let me get the name of this thing right. It was the ADO, Microsoft ADO.net Entity Framework 4 Feature Community Technology Preview 4 because we rock at naming things. My goodness. Um, <laughs> and Hanselman is like, yeah, I'm, not, I'm never calling it that. I'm going to call it the Magic Unicorn Edition. Um, and that's, yeah, that's really where that came out of. And oh, our team embraced that. Uh, we pranked uh, Rowan Miller one one time. I think he was, I think he was gone on paternity leave maybe, or just on vacation. And we filled his office with these inflatable unicorns. Just, like, <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Even oh, our I'd Twitter to see that. today. Oh yeah, I think there's pictures. I'll, I'll try and find some. Um, uh, even our, our Twitter account today is at EF Magic Unicorns. Um, and I don't know if you've ever typed .NET EF. There's mm -hmm. this, this magnificent ASCII art unicorn that I spent way too much time drawing. <laughs> <laughs> and I put it in as a joke, but it totally like landed in the product, which is great. Um, and yeah, that's about the time I joined is right around this magic, magic unicorn edition. Um, I was a tester on, I think it was the DB context stuff and there was like nothing left to do because they had been like four previews in. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, that's one of my, my story sort of joined the entity framework story. Um, one of the first features I got put on was uh, code first migrations. You know, it was great that we had this, this way of creating databases from a model, but schema migrations then become very important. And I was a tester. It was me as a tester. Rowan was the PM and Andrew Peters was the developer. And if you've ever typed enable migrations, you might see those three names pop up. Not anymore, we had to take it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so right at that time, Andrew, the lead dev, went on paternity leave. So I, as a tester, stepped in to do some of this dev work. And that's really how I got my foot in the door in, in the dev role. Um, I remember one time, uh, it was just before like build or mix or something, whatever it used to be called, uh, Scott Hanselman like calls me up on my phone and I'm just like, I hate phones. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was like completely starstruck and just like stuttering over my own words. And he's like, how do I use this stuff? I'm demoing it in like a few hours. <laughs> so, Goodness. so I got to explain to Scott Hansen how to use entity framework migrations. Um, that was, was quite the experience. Cool. So um, you explained a little bit about the, the history of EF and how it kind of came from this concept of a, I guess a database file system and how to interact with that. But why did the why did the devs hang on so tightly to it? I mean, if if Link to SQL was already there and there was already in Hibernate, and I believe there was another one called uh, Subsonic, like there were solutions, and of course there's always classic ADO.net. Um, why why did they hang on to EF so tightly? What what was the what was the benefit that they felt that they could not let go? I think there was this this huge vision around this entity data model. You know, you had, you had O data, like exposing it, like HTTP endpoints to a database. And you had this, like these microservices communicating using O data. 
And EDM was like a key part of that. And so if you could reuse that EDM and map it to the storage model, um, I think it was just this big vision of, you know, this was a time when we, we thought everything would be driven by XML instead of JSON. And <laughs> <laughs> philosophies change, you know, even, even now, like the EDM in OData and the EDM in EF are like barely related. Um, but I think that was a big part of it. They just, they really had a vision for this thing. Um, it didn't pan out. And so in the in the same um, kind of tone, um, why today would you choose uh, Entity Framework over something like, um, well, classic ADO.net, because that's still there. I mean, even EF is built on top of, of that, right? Or yeah, uh, right. or something like, uh, like Dapper. Yeah, you know, it's kind of funny. I'm actually a huge fan of Dapper. Um, I hate raw ADO.net. I don't ever want to write another line of creating a command and assigning parameters. Like it's terrible, right? Mm -hmm. And Dapper fills this amazing niche. Like it makes ADO.net just so much more usable. I, I, I work on a SQLite ADO.net provider and I just wish I could write all my tests using Dapper. <laughs> <laughs> this is this great API. And if you know SQL, like I love it. Um, but Entity Framework, I think I think Entity Framework gives you that, that that strong syntax of link and it gives you this identity map and it gives you this change tracking, you know, it's full ORM. I think there's, there's space for, um, there's space for a micro ORM, there's space for a full ORM, even Stack Overflow, the creators of Dapper, you know, they use Dapper and they use Energy Framework Core. Um, kind of a philosophy we like to see on the team, use on the team is, you know, use Energy Framework, use that rich ORM for this rapid development, you know, like it makes your life easier. You don't have to think about things, but then when you start testing it, you really start performance testing it. If Energy Framework becomes a, becomes a performance bottleneck and you've tuned it as much as you can, maybe dropping down to Dapper is the right thing. You know? hmm. That's that's certainly what the people at Stack Overflow have had to do because they're such a, you know, such a busy website. Yeah, well, and they they optimize the living daylights out of that thing, so. So EF, because it is so much easier to deal with, maybe one of the other ones because you've you've hit that that limit that you can push EF to and you need something closer to the metal. You can get pretty close to the metal in Entity Framework as well. Um, but yeah, I, I think just having multiple tools in your toolbox uh, is really awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, pick your favorite, you know, learn your one tool. Uh, most For most people, that's going to be an energy framework, and it's probably in the box. It's the default, for better or worse, you know. I'm sure there are very elegant solutions out there. Um, but to me, it's about knowledge transfer, you know, like how much can I apply these skills to this job over here and that job over there. Um, and yeah, certainly have those backup tools for when, when energy framework just isn't getting it done for you. Um, on the other hand, we strive to, you know, help you as much as we can with <laughs> and make it as performant as we can. And we think we've done tons in Energy Framework Core compared to Energy Framework. Um, yeah, before we get to get Entity Core or Entity Framework Core, what do you know, or just kind of talking more on the when to use Entity Framework, are, are there any specific edge cases that you definitely talk about performance or are there any other sort of situations where you'd say, hey, maybe we shouldn't shouldn't be using any framework, I would recommend moving in a different direction? A lot of it comes down to the, the programming model. Um, you know, Energy Framework has link queries and, and it has the staple DB content, or not staple, but this, this set of work. If that's just not working in your app, in your application architecture, look at alternatives. There's, there's some great alternatives out there, like an active record type pattern. Um, there's this strange, data access thing called Lime Bean. It's supported this technology called Red Bean from PHP and it's this active directory. And so instead of like getting entities from the database and making changes to them and saving them in a, in a transaction, you kind of query for an entity and then you pass that thing around and you just call save on that entity. And it really decouples, you know, your data layer. And if that works better for you in your architecture, go for it. Okay. And then I, I'm kind of really still uh, curious about how EF Core sort of grows out. So, so, you, so far, you've given us a lot of history uh, for Entity Framework, and um, but then you have this whole new direction. And it, 
chance to maybe like start over and re redo some things from, yeah, from the ground um, up. Uh, what was this that was like? an awesome time to work at, on the team. Um, so we had just come out of Energy Framework 6, and a lot of the stuff we tried to do, you know, Energy Framework 5, we finally shipped enums. You know, six years later, we finally supported <laughs> enums in your storage model. And the reason behind that was because of the strict type system that was the Energy Data model. Um, if you add a new type there, you have to plummet through the entire stack. Um, and it was becoming apparent to us that like evolving energy framework to get the features people wanted was not, was a considerable amount of work. And then on the other hand, we had this, this crazy new technology that was called Project K, um, which was the ASP.NET, a new ASP.NET runtime, this cross-platform, lighter weight thing. And it was it was sort of the sibling of Project N, which was .NET native, which was like client side ahead of time compilation. Um, and we did, uh, we did some research, like what is it gonna take to port Energy Framework 6 to this new .NET Core, I'll just call it .NET Core for the sake of simplicity. And the am amount of work was just insane. Like <laughs> .NET Core was this, this stripped down API. A lot of people experience this when like .NET Core one days, trying to port your app, there's nothing there. <laughs> like, like half your code doesn't compile. Um, we use a lot of reflection.emit in Energy Framework and the story was it will never support that. And so we would have to go through and change all our materialization code. And we just like that coupled with, we can't really evolve this thing as fast as we'd like. We started thinking, what if we started over? Um, mm -hmm. What if we kept the DB context API but we completely changed everything underneath it. Um, and we did, we, we re-architected it. We had these sort of philosophical points in mind. Um, you know, we wanted it to be pay per play. You know, if you're not using a feature, you shouldn't have to pay the cost of that feature. Uh, we don't wanna, we didn't wanna abstract, create like this, this omni abstraction over every store possible where you don't have to think about whether you're targeting Oracle or SQL Server or Postgres. <laughs> um, that sounds wonderful and academic, but in the real world, like what if you want to start using some store specific features? Um, it yeah. kind of breaks down. And so we wanted to, we wanted to provide a common programming model, which was this DB context and this link based stuff, but then have a way of just lighting up store specific functionality like on SQL Server to just opt into memory optimized tables or start doing um, spatial queries if it's supported. Um, and so, and at the same time, fix these architectural issues um, that were preventing us from evolving energy framework. Um, and this, like I said, this time, this was just an amazing time to be on .NET at Microsoft. They were redoing everything. You know, this is the time when Roslyn was just coming out. They're rewriting the C-sharp compiler. The Ryujit was a thing. Like, they're rewriting the jitter. They're redoing how NuGet packages get installed. Everything was new. Um, and it was just really this awesome time of experimentation. Uh, and so one of our goals was actually NoSQL databases, which, by the way, stands for not only SQL, not NoSQL whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> and so we actually prototyped uh, a wide column store database, Azure Table Storage. We prototyped a key value store uh, in Redis. Uh, we just barely shipped in EF Core 3.0, a, a document database uh, for Cosmos, Cosmos DB. And so this idea of having a common programming model that could light up all these different storage types. And, and again, we're not trying to create an abstraction. We're not trying to hide the fact that if you do 10 joins on a document database, it's going to be slow as tar. Like <laughs> document databases aren't supposed to be used that way. Um, but if you can, if you know that and you can write your queries in a way that document databases are intended to be used, there's less of a learning curve. Yeah. So I saw that there was a lot of conversation about when the, the document DB document DB provider was released and, and being discussed that an object relational mapper interfacing with a document DB was, was a little, little bit odd. Um, and I know the, those early releases weren't fully featured. They, they weren't on parity with the prior re releases. And I know that there were things that uh, were missing that, that made life a little bit more difficult for, for the early adopters. Um, but I know that, that since then, a lot of uh, additional features have come out in, in the most recent versions. Um, there, there's also been, uh, the, I know there was improvement and in, in, uh, functionality added for 
uh, like group buy. And um, there was, I think lazy loading was, was recently added. Um, we're, we don't know why. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Customers asked for it. We gave it to them, but we made it a lot more strict than it was in the F6. <laughs> yeah, are, are there specific um, things to keep in mind for optimization in dealing with the uh, with with EF core and in ORMs in general, um, looking at the the query plans and the the queries being executed, are there specific things to keep in mind? I think the big thing is testing, like test that your query does what you think it does. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to dig down into the SQL unless you like to dig it down into the SQL. And I think the the point when profiling becomes important is when you have a perf bottleneck, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, is there an index you can add mm. to make this query way better? Can you can you switch a few things around in the link query? Can you maybe send two queries? Um, and yeah, that's that's when I think like you should really dig into it. But as far as like correctness, like write some tests, write some sample data. If this column's null here, does my query work the way I think it does? Um, yeah, uh, <laughs> that's the advice I have there. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know, I know I've run into a couple of issues with like uh, concurrent connections. I know with the DB context pools that you you can't do the same type of switch that you could previously uh, with allowing concurrent connections. So um, I had to do some, some jumping through some hoops to, to get around some issues that I was ex experiencing in, in my particular use case. Um, are there any other new features that you're excited about that uh, maybe we can start talking about or, or looking forward to? Yeah, definitely. Um, we just released uh, an new framework three, any framework core 3.0, 3.1 actually. It was basically the same thing. <laughs> 3.1 <laughs> is really just a patch if, if you really want to squint and look at it that way. Um, we added a C Sharp 8 support for 08 for each, uh, and we added the conventions for nullable reference types. So we used to be able to annotate your class with like a required attribute. Well, now required is kind of part of the type system. And so we can use that to determine whether a string column is optional or required. Um, and then at the same time, we also rewrote the entire link provider, <laughs> um, which has a fun story to it. So when we first got started, you know, writing an entire link provider is daunting and we knew we couldn't really do that before the 1.0 time frame, and so we had this idea, this experiment really of mixed mode evaluation. Well, we'll translate what we can, and we'll just do the rest in memory on your client, which sounds really cool until you're pulling back your entire database just to perform <laughs> a where clause to select a single row. Um, <laughs> and so it was really a pit of failure, and, and we recognize that. But that's another thing about Entity Framework Core is we really have this room because it's not updated in place, we have this room to experiment, try things, learn from our mistakes. Um, and so that was 3.0 and, and the query pipeline now is, is a lot cleaner and we feel like we can evolve it more. There were certain types of group by the, because of some of the technologies we were using, we were limited in translating them. So we really needed to get away from that. Um, and we hope it's in a much better place where we can evolve it and translate more patterns. And then coming up, we have Energy Framework Core 5. Um, super early planning. Uh, yes, we're skipping a version again. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it's going to be super confusing when we have Energy Framework Core 6. Um, <laughs> we might skip that version too. Who knows? Um, but yeah, and so we just released sort of our early thinking on the plans. And we want to tackle some of these things that are keeping people from writing their apps the way they want to. A big one for that is many-to-many -many associations. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's all possible today. You know, you, you can map the join table to an association class. Mm -hmm. Your queries become really weird because you do like blogs.taggings.tags instead of just blogs.tags. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's all possible. We have all the groundwork underneath the covers to do it for you. We're just going to try and let you write that blogs.tags um, to get all the taggings mm -hmm. of a blog. Um, and just sort of hide the rest from you as, as it was NES6. And one of the reasons we've been so hesitant to add this feature is in EF6, we found most real world apps have some sort of payload. Like, when was that tag added? When was it last updated? And so it's like, even though you have these many, 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 many to many, um, the next thing you do is 
sort of like decompose them back into these one to many's. Um, mm -hmm. And so we thought we could, the workaround wasn't terrible enough that we could sort of hold off on the implementation of that, but we think the time has come, you know, it's one of those critical features that are just a pain to work around. Mm -hmm. um, another one in a, in a similar vein is TPT mapping, which is uh, one table maps to one CLR type. And so if you have a hierarchy, um, you know, person, employee, customer, getting each of those types to map to an individual table. Uh, a lot of people think this is a, a perf anti-pattern, um, and, and it can be. But if you're working with a legacy database and the DBA said, this is how the tables are, you don't have a choice. And so we want to let you be able to have a choice in your C sharp at least, and to be able to yeah. map that as a hierarchy and use those things polymorphically as the domain intended it to be. And those are the big, big features, the big paper cut features that we're really trying to address. Um, are those, and at the are, same time, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, at the same time we're doing uh, TPT mapping, we're gonna also keep in <laughs> mind things like TPC mapping, which is where you push all the, all the leaf classes into their own tables. Um, you sort of collapse the data all down to the leaves and, and entity splitting, which is where you have one class that's backed by like two or more um, two or more tables. They're all kind of related, and so we'll keep them in mind. And while those other, while TPC and entity splitting aren't necessarily goals, we're going to keep them in mind while we do mm -hmm. TPT, and hopefully it'll be easier to add them later. Um, so those are the big ones. We're also going to look at uh, how to make deployment easier. Um, today, we give you a SQL script for your migrations and say, good luck, figure out how to run <laughs> this thing. <laughs> And if you're in Visual Studio, uh, to be fair, the experience is really good if you right-click publish, which mm -hmm. some people are very reluctant to do. But the experience is pretty good because it wraps that thing up inside of a, a web deploy package. And you publish it to your server, and it applies it to SQL Server. We want to kind of bring that that nice experience to other databases like Postgres and Oracle, kind of. And so we're doing some early thinking around that. Um, we're also going to start looking at client apps. I don't know if you've heard of this crazy thing called Blazor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pretty cool. It's oh, yeah. that running on the client. Uh, it's very similar to Xamarin. Um, and we want to look at sort of our patterns around how to make EF work better there. Um, cool. So are you docs, we could always use more docs. <laughs> nice. Are you looking to, to coordinate the, the EF, EF core five release with .NET five? In uh, yeah, this definitely. November? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All our build infrastructure is kind of tied together. And so we all ship together. Um, we've looked at options of shipping sooner, but I don't <laughs> I don't know that there's a need. I think shipping every year is awesome. <laughs> cool. Oh, and another cool thing we've recently had, there's lots of little features too, like those are the big ones. Um, some of the little features, like you, you mentioned, we added lazy loading proxies. We just added a community contribution for change tracking proxies, uh, which is great. <laughs> Sorry, we're John, passing notes John back and forth. <laughs> Throwing it off. All right. So you mentioned uh, docs and docs being better. Uh, are there are there any specific resources that you might um, point listeners to if they're looking to you know spin up some EF uh, in their project and they want to find out how they can do that and uh, learn learn more about it? Yeah. If you go to docs.microsoft.com/ef, um, we these are the developer team writes these docs, and so they're very accurate. <laughs> well, <laughs> until we change behaviors of things, but <laughs> we try and keep them. We try and keep them up to date. We try and make them as usable as possible. This is a really good way to to dive into the more technical points of Entity Framework, because it is written by the devs. You know, we want to make sure you understand how it works behind the scenes to give you the best chance of success that you have. There's also, you know, Plural Site courses and all kinds of great books. So. Okay. Okay, uh, and then to sort of wrap up and uh, going in a different direction, uh, would you just sort of give um, you know our listeners who are maybe 
uh, just getting started or they're trying to level up their career, what, what kind of piece of advice would you tell them specifically, um, EF Core or anything else, you know, what development in general? I think my, my biggest advice uh, comes from the Pragmatic Programmer books. It's um, really care about your craft. Um, you know, love love what you do and, and really learn the ins and outs of it. You know, learn everything there is to learn about your editor, about your the language you're using, about the testing framework. You know, nobody wants to learn about the testing framework. It's boring. Um, but as you do these things, you'll find that your own craftsmanship will improve. Um, and dabble. I love to dabble in everything, you know. Try using no NoSQL. Um, <laughs> you may not have a use case for it, but just try it and see. Um, <laughs> if you like game development, try Unity. Did you know you can write C sharp, you know, in, in Unity? It's pretty awesome. Um, and and then again, like being on the being so immersed in data, like try different data technologies, like try Dapper, try Energy Framework. Um, Xamarin has a really cool technology called SQLite Net. Um, uh, it's another, it's, I, I like to call it, it's not quite a micro ORM, but it's not a full ORM. It's more like a, a senti ORM or something. Um, it, you get, you know, you don't have to, I think it has like a query language, but it's not link or anything. Um, and then there's weird data access technology. Oh, sorry, I probably shouldn't say weird. That might be mean, but very <laughs> radically different. <laughs> A data access technology is like the line being one I mentioned, or there's um, simple dot data by Mark Rendell. Uh, it's I, David Fowler made a blog post once about like this idea of a dynamic link provider. And so it's really this weird sort of query driven data access technology, and it'll figure out your data model based on the query you write. Um, it's hmm. just inside out and it's fun, you know, it, it gives you interesting ideas, and different tools to work with. Um, and then, of course, you know, keep up with the state of the art, listen to podcasts, read blogs, um, you know, <laughs> I love this podcast. I listen to it myself. So <laughs> it's, it's a key to my own success. Cool. Uh, if if uh, our listeners wanted to follow you or kind of reach out to you, whatever, uh, would there be what would like social media? What, what would be the best way for them to do that? So my blog is brycelam.net, B-R-I-C-E-L-A-M.net. On Twitter, I'm Bryce Lamb BS. <laughs> my, my main alias was taking him, and I felt the BS was appropriate for Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm on GitHub, GitHub slash Bryce Lamb. Uh, I'm on Stack Overflow. A lot of users are shocked to get an answer from a member of the EF team on Energy Firm. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, the docs, I think, are just a, a great learning resource. Cool. All right. Thanks, Bryce. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk with us today. Thanks for having me. That was Bryce Lamson. Bryce is a senior software engineer on the Entity Framework team at Microsoft. In his spare time, he enjoys giving back to the community through blogging and open source. If you like this episode, please like, rate, and review on iTunes. Find show notes, blog posts, and more at sixfiguredev.com. And be sure to follow us on Twitter at sixfiguredev. This has been another episode of the Six Figure Developer Podcast, helping others reach their potential. I am John Calloway. I'm Clayton Hunt. And I'm John Ash.